Happy 30th anniversary, Sonic! You're over the hill, lying in the tooth, you're- Oh, jeez! Sorry, I forgot that you, uh, never mind. I, uh, brought your favorite, uh, Chili Dogs. Uh, have you seen that new fan game, S Sonic GT? It looks pretty cool. I'm sure if Sega did something like that, then- <sighs> Sorry, I- I know. I'll be going now. Get well soon, okay? Hey there, Pyromaniacs. Sonic's been in a rough state for a while now. And no, it has nothing to do with a rough transition to 3D or anything like that. In all honesty, nobody really knows how or when it happened. But one day, we all just kind of woke up and... Yeah. It seems as though every time it looks like things are looking up, things seem to immediately go south for the little guy. And honestly, I can't help but blame Sega's relentless desire to please the game publications that spent the last 20 years lambasting every single action the company took. Sonic was never good. I'm not gonna act like Sega or Sonic Team are perfect companies. They can be outright incompetent at times. But when you look at how game critics treated the IP throughout the 2000s, I think anyone would draw the conclusion that sometimes these publications could be just a bit too harsh. Like I stated in my Sonic 4 video, a big thing that made Sonic Team stand out from other studios to me was their tendency to experiment with their projects and see what worked and what didn't with the Sonic license. And of course, just like any experiment, sometimes they'd end up with gold, and sometimes they'd end up with trash. But something happened to this drive to try new things somewhere at the beginning of the 2010s. Something happened that made Sonic Team give up on the bizarre and the edgy, and move closer to the safe and the nostalgic. And as much as I hate to say it, I think Sonic Unleashed might have been a contributing factor to this shift. If not, the final straw altogether. So without further ado, let's look at what may be Sonic's most divisive outing. Let's jump in to Sonic Unleashed. Sonic Unleashed began development almost immediately after the advent. I've seen a lot of sources claiming that Unleash started development as Adventure 3, which is supposedly hinted in its working title, Sonic World Adventure. But I personally don't believe this, since I've found no definitive sources of that being the case. That being said, you can definitely tell that the unspeakable game definitely had an impact on the game's overall design. The character designs are more cartoony, interactions are a little more lighthearted, and the most noticeable change being the gameplay. This is basically how I imagine the team coming up with the gameplay of Unleashed. Hey, you remember that Sonic Rush game Dimps made? Yeah, it's like the best game ever made, what about it? What if we took this gameplay and put it in 3D? I don't know, so Sonic's pretty fast in those games, he might be a little hard to control in 3D. Well, what if we made all the levels straight lines with the occasional curve and branching path? Oh, so, uh, basically what we did with, uh, Secret Rings? Yeah, pretty much, but, uh, better. Yeah, cool, 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 cool. All right, cool. So, uh, can, can can we put the cat girl in this one? Why? I, uh, I, I kind of think she's hot. Get out of my office. Yep, they basically just took the boost mechanic introduced in the Sonic DS games, blew it up for a bigger screen, and made it 3D. Sometimes. This was the first Sonic game to have levels that transition between both 2D and 3D. And while personally I've grown kinda tired of this style over the years, it was a cool idea for the time and still holds up pretty well. The level structure is drastically different from the exploration-based structure of the adventure games, or whatever the heck Heroes was going for. Going instead for levels that are more linear, but still just as challenging. The game's levels have a higher focus on anticipating what's ahead of you and reacting accordingly, essentially making the game into a high-octane obstacle course. This can be pretty frustrating for your first playthrough, but it also motivates you to learn the levels so you can beat your previous time. And in that way, it actually perfectly encapsulates Sonic design philosophy, if in a different approach. But of course... Those levels aren't the ones people remember this game for. People remember this game for its edition of... The Werehog. You see, in this game, Eggman essentially wins by extracting the Chaos Emeralds directly from Super Sonic, and using the Chaos Emeralds to finally achieve his dream of... blowing up the Earth, I guess? 
How do you like that, Obama? I'm pissed off you, you idiot! After having the Chaos Emeralds forced out of Sonic's body, the negative energy mutates him into a hairy, wolf-like monster with stretchy arms. Why does he have stretchy arms, you ask? So he can sure you can the sh** out of his enemies! Yeah, the vast majority of the stages in this game aren't the daytime speed stages, but are instead mostly composed of these combat-based nighttime werehog stages. These levels are considerably slower paced than the daytime stages, which is to be expected as they play more like a typical hack and slash game rather than a fast-paced platformer. Instead of speeding along and trying to anticipate your next move, you're instead exploring large levels, doing puzzles, and fighting hordes of enemies. These Werehog levels were a deal breaker for so many people, and I really can't blame them. It's a massive departure from not just the traditional Sonic formula, but even the formula introduced within this same game. That being said, the combat is a lot more in-depth than I feel a lot of people give it credit for, with several different cool combos to pull off. And I actually find it really fun. What can I say? I'm a sucker for a good hack and slash. Here's the thing. No matter how much I might enjoy some of these stages, they're just not something I want from a Sonic game. If I want to play a hack and slash, I'm not going to pick up a Sonic game. I'm going to pick up Devil May Cry or Bayonetta. Just like if I want to play a slow and traditional collectathon platformer, I'm going to pick up Mario or Spyro. It's just not Sonic's brand. Don't get it twisted, I'm in no way against alternate gameplay styles in Sonic games, but they have to have that focus on the frantic, speedy playstyle the Sonic games are known for. I can totally see a hack and slash levels with snappy and fun combat fitting perfectly within the flow of a Sonic game, but the night stages tend to just feel way too tedious and at times even outright monotonous. Despite that, I'd probably still be able to forgive these stages' existence if they didn't completely overshadow the daytime stages in terms of playtime. If these levels were shorter and the combat was a little snappier, then I really wouldn't have an issue with them. But as they stand, I can't help but feel like they tend to break the momentum of the fast-paced daytime stages. That being said, this game still gets way too much flack just because of the werehog. The adventure games had their slog fests too, and people still enjoy those games just fine. Not to mention this game is absolutely gorgeous. This was the first game to use the Hedgehog engine, and they really pushed it to its limits. In my opinion, this is still the best looking Sonic game to this day. Honestly, if you still want to try this game out in full, I'd recommend it, warts and all. But if you just want to try the daytime stages and have an okay PC, then the Project Unleashed mod is a decent alternative. Although it's kind of a pain to get up and running nowadays. I feel that with the backlash the Werehog received, Sega and Sonic Team ended up losing faith in the concept of multiple gameplay styles within a single game, which we will definitely cover in a later video. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, leave a like and become a pyromaniac yourself by subscribing. Until next time, stay dirty, my friends.